Sure. Okay. Well, hi everybody, and um, thank you uh, to the ICG for inviting me to um, participate in this webinar. Um, I realise that the name of the webinar is um, called Games for Research Bre Breakthrough Techniques or Just a Bit of Fun, um, and my thinking is very much that it's not just a bit of fun. Um, in fact, there's a lot of serious stuff. Um, to use extreme layman's terms, uh, behind uh, games in the traditional industry of gaming and also f in games for research. Um, you might notice um, throughout this presentation that I don't really refer to gamification, but just games. And um, as John was uh, just saying about sort of getting fixated on the term, I, I think that people do often view gamification as a fad. And um, in the gaming industry, particularly the word gamification is seen as such a dirty word and I just think let's just say what it is that we do and um, I know that I make games for research and so I, I prefer to use that term um, but before I um, go, go ahead into the presentation itself I think it's really important to remember that what we're really trying to do um, after John and I and other people who are uh, making games for research or, or using gamification indeed are really just trying to get away from this um, and this is a little do doodle of mine which I think really replicates reality um, the sneezing panda YouTube video although let in, is less than a minute has gained hundreds and thousands of hits on YouTube and yet watching that video doesn't give people any say in the world around them or the products that they buy or the services that can be developed to help people in their day-to-day -day lives um, but there are certain emotions evoked when watching the sneezing panda very different to the lack of emotions evoked by traditional surveys and you can see here somebody is looking at a very traditional grid type question on the left and is thinking bugger this and um, doing something else and I think that's key as well in today's um, society where we have all of these stats about how our attention spans are not what they used to be and indeed that has been proven um, and we are competing as an industry for people's attention in in light of you know the amount of um, you know reads that Mashable gets or Facebook people um, uh, Facebook is used and Twitter and so on and um, so I think it's really important to um, provide an enjoyable experience to participants and um, that obviously means engaging those people um, and so when I started research through gaming about two and a half years ago um, I was really keen to um, make sure that all people that take part in our research games really enjoy them and by doing so want to come back for more um, not just with our company but with other companies as well because they're starting to realize that there are huge benefits in research and taking part in a research game as I like to call them is is just as enjoyable as spending time on on other websites and obviously the design of a research game is is quite key to getting people to take part in your survey. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'll just debunk um, the three most common misconceptions. And um, I, I am writing a book on the uses of games in research, which is going to be published this December, where I'll be debunking these misconceptions in much more detail. Um, but I'll just kind of go over them very briefly. So throughout the two and a half, three years that I've been working on games research, people have often said to me, what well, aren't games just about bright colours and indeed I've actually heard people stand up on a stage at conferences and say that games are about bright colours and I'm afraid to say no they're absolutely not about bright colours and any Call of Duty fans listening um, to this will, will know that there's not a fluorescent yellow or hot pink in sight in Call of Duty and it's one of the most successful games of all time. Um, games and gamification in research is not Rewording questions on its own, while as John mentioned, it's extremely useful, but the way you ask the question on its own is not a game. Uh, making fonts bigger, brighter, or generally, you know, the look and feel more cool on its own, again, is not a game. Um, for example, this Prezi is not a game, while it is definitely more visually appealing and decorative. Um, and just some small screenshots below there of other award-winning games in traditional gaming that have done extremely well, and again, not a bright colour in sight. Um, but the uh, use of bright colours and interesting fonts and making a traditional survey look um, more aesthetically pleasing is often referred to as surveytainment. But surveytainment is, of course, not a game. 
Um, and to move on to the second um, common misconception, so uh, again, where other people have um, often said these things to me, is that, yeah, well, games are just for kids, so you, you can't make a game for research because then other older people won't take part. Um, and again, that's simply not true. The average game purchaser is 35, the average game player is 30, and in the last five years the traditional gaming audience has hugely widened where you often see, and it's and it's quite commonplace now to see children as young as from four accessing games on iPads and iPhones, um, and we Fit being used in retirement homes and um, indeed game uh, platforms being used um, for uh, people, particularly in healthcare, who are, are much older than 40 and 50 years old. Uh, and indeed, in my own research games that I've created with my team here, um, we've seen that games um, for research can have a, a very wide audience. Um, and I know actually one of my clients is listening to this webinar, um, Dr. Georgina Turner, who was part of the team that commissioned um, this game that we created called Tessa Undercover Agents. Um, that was aimed at 1,400 people in the UK, where people aged 18 to 65 plus played the game. And um, here are just some of the um, bits of feedback from the older age groups that we have. Uh, had, which um, firmly uh, debunk that games are not just for kids. So you can see here that um, a male aged 72 um, said that he enjoyed playing this game very much and admitted that he's not a gamer and neither does he use smartphone or phone apps, but he also learned for this gaming experience. So actually what you've got within that quote is, itself is another misconception to be debunked that people need to be tech savvy to play games um, and again that's all about your design and execution if you're reaching an audience age 18 to 65 plus you need to ensure that in your design people age 72 and 68 can access your game as easily as an 18 year old could and you can see some other quotes here so um, a lady aged 68 saying you know the mission was thoroughly enjoyable and you know uh, another female age 67 saying that she wished that we could have more I, I assume research like that and um, I, I'm going to be giving some more feedback later on this presentation other things that people said about this game test undercover agents but here are just some pieces of evidence that games are not just for kids um, and the third misconception is that games are all about fancy graphics and they're really, really not. Um, I've made two games for researchers to play that take place in the real world, and I've been told that they're very engaging and educational, and they don't use any graphics at all because they're in real life. And indeed, with online surveys, it doesn't need to be about fancy graphics as well. And in a moment, I'll be telling you about the key mechanics that make a game a game without the mechanics. And here's an example of um, a, a, a screenshot from the Zork series that was um, very popular in the 1970s and you can see here it's not very fancy at all, um, in fact more akin to traditional surveys we see today um, where the rules and the narrative and the goals and the feedback are all here but you can just see that there's a, a black background with white writing and it, this is a um, computer role-playing game so the computer um, instructs the player on what to do and you know key areas of the narrative or request and then you as the player would write back that you are going to open a certain door or open a certain box and other things would happen from there so the story would move on and this at the time um, was one of the most um, successful games and um, it's got such a huge fan following that people still play games from the Zork series now so creating a good game is also timeless and, and as you can see not about fancy graphics um, but yeah just to um, move on here to the next um, slide so it's a little bit slow um, but yeah, I also get asked a huge amount if 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 games for research can only be used for a particular study or a particular age group, well I've just shown that games can be created for research for all age groups, but they can be used in a multitude of research studies as I have done here at Research for Gaming. So we have created games for ad testing, for product development, um, we've also made games for focus groups and indeed as I mentioned earlier I've made 
to research games for researchers to play. Um, they can be used in horse tests and concept testing, for healthcare studies, for children's studies, again, as I've done here at Research for Gaming, for education, and, you know, the list is endless. So it can be applied to any kind of research study, as long as, obviously, you use the key rules, if you like, that make a game a game. Um, so I'm going to pass you two acronym sets, if you like, and in market research we do really love an acronym, that will help you go back to the office if you're not there at the moment or finish up this webinar and be able to design a research game for yourself. And if you think that you can't do it because you're not creative, I'm afraid I'm going to have to debunk that theory too because I've done lots of workshops for the Market Research Society here in London and people come to learn how to use gamification for research or games for research. And um, one of the first questions to ask is, you know, put your hands up if you consider yourself a creative person. And um, very often I'll only get one or two people put their hands up. But then by the end of the workshop, people have created a research game by using this acronym set that you see that you'll see here. And they can feel really confident that actually it's again not about fancy graphics because as long as you have these um, rules there you can make a very effective game for research. So all games that you would have played as a youngster playing hide and seek or you know even now as an adult playing things like Call of Duty or Farmville or Candy Crush, all games at their most basic form have what are called RAVA. So rules, a feedback system, Voluntary participation and a goal. The voluntary participation is very important and as Kristen Luck of Decipher put it very recently, often in research we trick and bribe our participants, telling them that the survey is 10 minutes when actually it's 20, telling them that they're going to be put into a prize draw where they know that there's no way in hell they're going to win anything. And um, obviously we have these participants who sign up to panels to take part in research and often you know it's it doesn't feel very voluntary because we've got to uh, bribe them uh, and trick them sometimes in this way uh, whereas creating a game for research will make participants feel so rewarded that maybe in the future with good game design and more of us making games for research people won't need prize draws because they're getting such a sense of achievement and a learning experience and a thought-provoking experience from the research game that they've played now the second layer, the icing on the cake if you like, is what I call cabin. Um, now back in the day when I used to talk about rather and cabin, there was only a one N. Now there's two and that's because through my study and development for research game I've realised that narrative is massively important. So you've got collaborative approaches and you see that loads in um, massively multiplayer online role playing games where people are collaborating in teams or dungeon raids. Um, a is for an ability to share, and that could be to share your achievements, um, to share your rewards, and Farmville uh, by Zynga are a, a very good example of that. And they're also a very good example of bonus features. So I know um, in Farmville and indeed the other Zynga games, games like Cafe World, um, you can you know play your game around Christmas or Halloween, and there will be um, graphics. Essentially, that's all they are graphics, but uh, available for you to purchase and they might be a Christmas tree, a snow blanket and it's these bonus features that keep people interested. A surprise if you like, away from the norm, otherwise without bonus features games can quickly become quite boring. Um, Eyes for increases in problem solution methodology and I do this in quite a subtle way with my research games where as the levels go on actually the more challenging the uh, the missions, if you like, or the um, increases for your promotion, whatever it might be in the role play or in the narrative, they become slightly more challenging. And that in itself is the key part of engagement in traditional gaming. And we all will know um, that, you know, playing Super Mario when we were younger, level one, world one was really easy um, in comparison to world eight, you know, level 10. Um, and that's because we are as gamers and, and players slowly but surely building our confidence and building our skills to get to the uh, more difficult enemies if you like. In terms of research it might be that you leave some of the more long-winded or challenging questions or even perhaps more sensitive questions later on down the line in your, in your research game. Uh, now as much as games are not about bright colours, a noticeable aesthetic is very interesting and um, in this game that created uh, we created called Tessa Undercover Agents we recalled 
some of those participants back to play a second research game called Dubious. And I noticed from just skim reading the comments, people did refer back to the Tessa game. So clearly it kind of stayed in their minds and that might have been through the noticeable aesthetic or it may have indeed been through the music and sound effects that we used. But still a, a noticeable aesthetic um, is part of engagement in gaming as well. With the narrative, I am I'm such a huge fan of the narrative and the more I read about traditional gaming, the more I apply it to my own research games, I can see how the narrative is there to support the research objectives. So how can I get the participant to feel a certain emotion about these questions, about this situation that they might find themselves in? And indeed, uh, in my work, I really believe in replicating real life emotions through games, through different scenarios and, um, you know, virtual environments if you like where that narrative of something that you have to do and the reason that you have to do it is is there and that's why you want to take part in this research game and just as an example um, when I was very young when I'd get bored of playing Super Mario I used to play a game called Little Nemo and I got quickly bored of it just because it didn't really seem like there was enough reason for me to play this game there wasn't a very strong narrative and a strong reason why I should play this game whereas in research games that you will hopefully create and I know I create the narrative is there to drive the motivation forward but yes um, moving on to acronym set number two so when you are designing a research game and you're ticking the boxes that you've got your rules in there and your feedback systems and your voluntary approaching or bonus features where needed and so on and so forth these are the other things that you need to consider and I call this recast just for in interest of kind of keeping it in um, in in the mind easily, and um, and I know that I uh, as well have done this with my own uh, clients and in game design. So the R is for the client's research objectives. You need to know that first before you start putting a narrative together. And if you're using an online survey, understanding the kind of visual um, aids that you're using. Um, a is for the age of the audience. The research game that you will develop for 7 to 10 year olds is going to be massively different to the research game you develop for, say, 65 plus year olds. Um, and so you have to obviously consider the language that you use, the visuals that you use, the narrative that you use. You need to make sure it's relevant to the age of your audience. C is for the culture of your audience. Now, there are some narratives that might not be suitable for a certain culture of audience, some narratives that might be and indeed visual stimulation and virtual environment so it's all about what's relevant to the culture of your audience and relevant to the narrative so for example how can a research game differ to participants that you're re reaching in the suburbs of India in comparison to people living in New York City and so the, the second A is for the client's analysis needs. So it's a really good idea, really good practice to understand what kind of analysis your client is doing at the back end and what they will then be uh, talking internally um, to their uh, other clients about. And indeed, there are, if they've got clients and uh, colleagues that they're um, feeding back to, understanding their analysis needs and that will help you design a better research game. And B is the budget of the client. Obviously, the bigger the budget, the better the research game that you can make because you can consider a lot, a lot more functionalities and have time to experiment more to get the perfect research game. Um, but indeed, it's important to note that a client with a budget is actually really exciting because you can really cherry pick the things that absolutely need to be in your research game. And, um, you know, the smaller the budget, you know that there's certain other things that, you know, you could do without so that you can stick to the financial um, confines that your client has. Um, so those are the two acronym sets that will help you make the best research game possible. Um, and it's also important to note that there are other things to consider. So here's a screenshot of Tessa Undercover Agent. So this is the first page that the place bondants, as I like to call them, would see. Um, and there's lots of other things going on here that you might not normally think are necessary in designing a research game. So there needs to be a really basic, if not advanced understanding of semiotics, of behavior economics, of psychology, understanding the user experience, understanding narratology, also understanding programming languages as well because if you're creating a game with a programming language that isn't um, 
used by certain devices, it can really um, affect your response rate in a negative way. Um, and also something that Research Through Gaming do is we use music and sound effects because we feel very strongly that that creates um, certain emotions that are relevant to the research objectives and um, also in a way to kind of control the speed of response as well. Um, and, and that's all going on here, even in this page that you can see here, the layout, the colours used, and obviously we've got quite a um, prominent narrative here that you're an undercover agent, and so the font that we use and the way that we're writing, the tone that we used, all play a part in supporting this narrative, which supports the research objectives. Um, so my client, um, Professor Lisbeth Van Zoon, and she was um, uh, she had commissioned us to create this research game as part of a wide academic study called Imprints Futures, which is very exciting, and I would recommend people to go to imprintsfutures.org and, and check that out. And um, what Lisbeth wanted to know was why are people so opposed to ID cards in the UK, for instance, but yet are happy to put lots of things about themselves on LinkedIn and Facebook. And she also wanted to know how people would identify themselves now and in the future to other people, to organisations and to objects. So, you know, how does my laptop know who I am? How does my um, you know, building society know who I am. And um, she also wanted to test futuristic forms of identity management as well. And so again, we considered her research objectives, we, create, we considered the age of the audience, um, who were aged 18 to 65 plus. Um, and I have to admit that designing a research game for such a wide audience can be quite tricky, because obviously the wider the audience, um, the, the more tactful you have to be with the narrative that you use and the semiotics that you use to um, be relevant to all those different age groups. And all the sample was from the UK as well. And we used a mix of visible and invisible timers, and we wanted to use visible timers so that we could evoke a sense of time pressure where necessary as well so we're using system one and system two thinking if we want to talk in sort of layman terms in uh, behavioral economics and again music and sound effects and um, uh, the games were for the first time partially playable on mobile devices as well which was um, really interesting and we also used um, new and old pieces of research and um, uh, new research findings mixed with, um, you know, traditional research, um, as well as lots of cultural value statements that uh, my client, as a as a professor, as an academic, had to have in in the game itself. And so um, you can see here um, just a, a kind of screen, uh, another screenshot from Tessa Undercover Agents, where um, Agent Nort, who is the um, enemy that needs to be captured, he is um, coming into uh, the room that you are in, and you um, have only 30 seconds before he opens the door and finds you. So you have to take the three most important forms of identity um, before you leave the room. So again, it's that time pressure. But all of this was um, was answering to her research objectives. So these are some examples of how you can do that. And um, with, with the um, idea of understanding identity in the future, um, well, identity in, in itself can be quite a odd concept to grasp in the kind of physical sense and in the philosophical sense. And so what we did was create a research game where you are living in the future, you have come back in time, so you're living in the year 2030, you've woken up in 2013, and your time machine has broken back and you have uh, broken down, and you have to convince three people that you're really from the future. One of those is your doctor, one of those is your friend, and one of those is your teacher or colleague. And again, that all relates to what my client wanted to find out. So she, uh, so we had this kind of scenario where your doctor was asking you questions and you have to convince him you're from the future. And by doing so, you will get a piece of your time machine fixed in order to go back. Um, and so he was asking, or he or she, whoever, you, if you said the doctor was male or female, would ask you how medical records are stored in the future or how medical records are accessed in the future, and what kind of future forms of ID would you be interested in that are related to med your medical issues. Um, and so, um, again, each person had their key sets of questions, and at the end of each level, depending on how you responded, you would get a summary of your future based on the things that you said. And we used an avatar creator tool in here as well, and uh, using an avatar on its own is not a game, but um, in traditional gaming has been proven to create a real emotional bond between player and avatar. And so I borrowed that in this 
game and indeed other games that we've made so that people can use the avatar for projective techniques and indeed to harness uh, data. For example, what forms of um, clothing would you wear as your future self and how would you dress your friends to pass as a citizen in the future and so we can literally see the clothes and the gadgets that those people are picking. And so I um, just want to share with you um, the evidence of increased engagement and enjoyment um, where people have said, you know, really wonderful things about the research game that they played. And um, here uh, I'll be showing you some of the feedback, um, but just want to quickly go back to um, just even the response rate alone. Uh, we created a game for seven to ten year olds in the UK in April 2012. And um, I was told repeatedly, you will not get 500 completes of 7 to 10 year olds in two weeks. It's too short a time, you need lo longer. Um, but actually what we found was that we had got just over 700 completes in just under seven days, so more than what the client wanted in half the time. And when we omitted the under seven year olds and over 10 year olds that the client didn't need, we still had 565 completes. So that's a really good example there of, I guess, the numbers that prove the um, increased engagement. And so here are just literally just a few of the bits of feedback from the, the children that we had saying you know, that the game was awesome um, and they said that they would like to play another game like that again. And you can see a girl age nine here said she enjoyed it a lot and enjoyed this kind of celebrity guessing game too at the end which was important to the client's data. And um, sorry, but the, it's a bit slow moving across the slides here. Um, but yeah, just an example here of the, um, uh, the, the, the feedback that we got from uh, Tessa Undercover Agents. So despite that they did a pre-survey and the research game itself, 25% of the uh, placebondents still had the energy to leave comments and feedback. Um, so people saying, you know, that was the best research survey I've ever done, bar none, and people saying it's so good and I'd like to do another research game like that again. Um, we also had five females comment um, on the fact that it was quite stressful and I thought that that was really quite fascinating because I did use music and sound effects and semiotics and the narrative to evoke stressful situations because it, in real life if you lost your identity actually that would be quite stressful. So I actually in a weird way enjoyed that they touched upon the emotions that I wanted them to feel. Some people didn't enjoy the music and were quite vocal about that and asked for a mute button, so we put a mute button in the, in the second game, Dubious, that they were asked to play. Um, but the, the majority of the participants left really wonderful, very humbling feedback. Um, and one of them going so far as to track me down on email and say, hey, I, I played this game called Tessa Undercover Agent, so I thought it was great but wanted to let me know that we had a couple of spelling mistakes in the game and um, telling me that she had to refresh a couple of times in order to play it. And I was actually really flattered by that because it just goes to show her interest in playing the game, rem even remembering that there were some spelling mistakes and taking the time out to let me know because she wanted to improve what we were doing. Um, so yeah, here are just some more bits of feedback as you can see. Um, people are also continuing to talk about the research itself. So someone is actually referencing a piece of um, futuristic identification, the RFID chip, and, and, and continuing to give their opinion about the research itself. So that means our client can gain more insights from, from that part too. Um, so in summary, um, games for research can and are much more engaging and enjoyable for participants. Um, I have a, 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 a big belief that it, it's all about evoking emotions that take place in real life. For instance, asking people what they buy in a supermarket. Well, actually, if you're a mother with a screaming child in your trolley and you've got a doctor's appointment in 10 minutes, the way you behave, the decisions you make will be very different. And what we try to do is replicate those real life situations in our games and that actually takes us away from being objective in research as we've often been taught for decades and decades and start being emotional because a lot of our decisions are based on how we're feeling at the time and the things going on around us. So it's game over for boring surveys and, uh, and, and boring um, research and hopefully with those acronym sets and the suggestions and the um, examples I've shown you 
all listeners can go off and confidently start designing research games for themselves. So thank you very much for listening and sorry if I've gone over time and I'd also actually while I'm here like to thank all participants that have taken part in our research games and um, our clients because obviously without them it wouldn't be possible to explore and develop in the way that we have. So yes, thank you very much and over to you Arthur.